good morning, church. It's great to be with you again this Sunday morning. And today we're celebrating International Women's Day. The title of my lesson is, I won't go unless. Our epic battle series began last week with the story of Exodus and how God brought the people of Israel out of slavery to the nation of Egypt through Moses. I didn't title it as part of the series, but it really was. The story of Moses is possibly one of the most amazing stories in the entire Bible history. And you know you're on top. You know what? You know you're one of those stories when Val Kilmer plays your character in an animated version of the story. As we look back though at some epic battles that happened in the Bible, we're going to see something crazy. We're going to see how these battles were fulfillment of something bigger that was pointing towards or pointing forward to an even more epic story in the life of Jesus. Today, though, I thought, because it's International Women's Day, let's look at Deborah. She's a character we find in Judges, and uh, she's not often recognized or given much credit for who she is, but her story is somewhat amazing. So I even looked online for sermons about Deborah, just to give me an idea of which way to go and how to preach about this, this amazing woman. And here's some of the titles that I found. Listen to these. Deborah, how to put a song in your heart. Or being a part of the dream team. Or Deborah and Barak. Star Wars. I, I, I really don't see how that works into the Bible story of Star Wars. But how about this one? What a mum's worth. Or women in the church. Or even, how can women support men, church? And the last one, the title was, Behind Every Great Man. So do you see my dilemma here? I'm preaching on women's International Women's Day, and what I'm getting is sermons on men with a little bit of women attached into it. So I wanted to look at an inspiring story that the whole church can look at. Not just women, and certainly I didn't want a token story in a male-dominated culture. This is a very hard undertaking. So an interesting side note. I just want to pull us off from Deborah for a second. Lisa and I recently met with another church group, and we wanted to talk about potentially renting space in their building because, as you know, we haven't met together since Lisa and I have been here in Edmonton. So I thought it might be a great idea to meet together as a church and it was tough, really tough for me, as we discussed the differences in church culture between us and this other group. It's not theological, necessarily, but cultural, our church culture. So there are some churches out there with similar belief systems to us in regards to theology and salvation. But there are things that are separate, or that separate us. And you, some of us, some of you might find this ridiculous. But there are things like, should we have one cup or many cups at a communion service? Or perhaps instruments or no instruments during the worship service. Mike Taylor even told me a story that in Texas, there was a church that actually split over whether they should allow hat racks in the cloakroom. So one of the comments I heard during our conversation was about musical instruments. And uh, some of the parishioners of this organization felt that it was sin to make noises with your mouth during a worship service. So I thought about it, I thought, beatboxing is a sin. You know, we can hear this story and we think, that's ridiculous. You can't say that. No way. But I want us to check our hearts as we read in Genesis chapter 2. So follow me with you. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 20. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any of the tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God formed out of the ground of all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. 
So the man gives names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. The Genesis story here is considered by some scholars to be a poem, a creation poem, if you will. I'm not going to try and get into a, a deep discussion or a, a theological debate on evolution or creation. But let's look at the idea of the male and female role in this creation story. Verse 21 to 22, it said, The Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with the flesh. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Wow. So if we look into this story here, this guy Adam. Adam meant or means dirt in Hebrew. Okay, that's not really how I want to be remembered or known as dirt or earth. But God creates this guy, dirt, and later on it says God takes something away from him to create Eve. And we've often, re often read this story or we've heard of Christian tradition that says, okay, Adam was cr is created in the image of God and women is the suitable helper, like it said. Woman was taken out of man. So woman, woman is the suitable helper because she was taken out of man. God created man in his own image. Woman is the helper. But if we look back, Genesis 1, the chapter right before this, verse 27 says, So God created mankind in his own image. Do you hear that word mankind? It says, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Wow, that kind of goes against the tradition of women being the suitable helper, doesn't it? It's not talking about companionship here. Though I believe companionship is important, but in order for life to thrive or survive, there needs to be tension. There needs to be something more than just companionship. That's why loneliness isn't good. We often use the word helper or helpmate to describe women, but the Hebrew word for that is Edzer Konegdo. I'm probably butchering that, but Edzer Konegdo. Edzer meaning to help, and Konegdo meaning against or opposition. So if you put that together, it means help that comes against or opposes. What? What are you guys talking about? Have you ever tried, here's the question though, have you ever tried to build an A-frame house, A-frame house with one two by four? It will crash down, you can't do it. You need something to support and hold that A-frame up. It's not good, God says, for man to be alone. Man is incomplete and it's more than just marriage. Lisa, for me, is the part that I'm missing. I can now stand complete because we're together. Lisa doesn't stand sub subservient to me because I'm the head. When we celebrate women today, you guys, we need to rethink our position on the Bible. If we can be re wrong in regards to beatboxing, couldn't we possibly be wrong in regards to the position of women in the church? So, back to the story of Deborah. That's just my side note. We're going to look at this book of Judges. You might be thinking, Judges? Why Judges? That book is messy. And I guarantee you most of those stories, maybe other than Samson, cannot go in the children's Bible. It's funny, if you look and, and you, you type in Judges in a Google search, you try it at home, you'll probably get back something like the sin cycle. The sin cycle. It's probably not the most reassur reassuring Google search on the planet. But God has these stories in the Bible for a reason. We may become a little confused with all the darkness, the dirtiness, the muck, unless we start to see our stories intertwined into these stories. Because often our stories are pretty dirty and mucky, aren't they? Maybe this is not about, about a group of people who did and lived at a certain time period back in a certain area? What if the stories are about people? Just people. What do people do in light or in contrast to a majestic and perfect God? 
when we look at what people are like, what they're really like deep down, we can start to see how God can take center stage in the book of Judges. If we go look closely, we can start to see it's not really a sin cycle, but it's a redemption cycle. It's God coming in and saving the day. So let's jump into the, the story of Deborah in Judges chapter 4. We're going to read verse 1 to 4. Follow along with me, will you? Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now that Ehud was dead, so the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Herosheth, Hagoyim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. Wow, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny how the story begins. Again. The story begins with, again. That means that it's not the first time. Actually, you know, chapter 3 begins with the same type of phrase about Israelites doing evil. Chapter 4, again, the Israelites do evil. And you guessed it. Once we get through Deborah's song in chapter 4, take a wild guess how chapter 5 starts. Again, Israel did, sight in, in, or did evil in the sight of God. So this here is our historical context. The people of Israel did evil, but God wants to redeem them. We do evil, God wants to redeem us. My hope is we don't want to wait 20 years before we cry out. But let's get back to the story, okay? People cry out, and guess what? God is listening. This is amazing. God's plan is already starting to unfold. Let's keep reading here in verses 4 to 5. It says, Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. Do you notice that the book doesn't say God called Deborah? God had already put Deborah in a place to bring order into chaos. Do you see that? God's plan was already in motion when the people cried out. His purposes were already intact. He was just waiting for us to cry out to him. Makes you think, doesn't it? God already has his people in place. The plan is in motion. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me to cry out. Okay, so let's go back to the story. She held court, verse 5. She held court in the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. So she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them, lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Wow. Okay, let's do a, do a review here. So for 20 years, for 20 years, God's people are in trouble because they've rejected God and they're forced into a terrible situation. Remember, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? So for 20 years, they're in a tough situation. God puts his redemption plan in motion and waits for the people to cry out. Then we see Deborah calling Barak into action. And I don't know if you noticed here, but the language is a little bit different. It seems to me that God has already spoken to Barak. It's kind of like Deborah is reminding him, not telling him for the first time, but reminding him. Do you see that? She already knows the word of what the word of God says, and she reminds Barak. Why do you think he she reminds him? Because he hadn't obeyed yet. He hadn't obeyed God's word yet, 
So Deborah reminds him. Deborah knows what the word of God says. She knows the heart, the need that the people have for liberation. And she understands the heart that God has for his people. But Barak is hesitating. He's not doing what God called him to do. It's not that God's word is not clear. In this case, it's not being obeyed. There's a big difference there. A lot of times, a lot of times we pray and we ask God, God, what do you want for, for me in my life? What do you want me to do? We're curious, aren't we? We're curious about the will of God for us in our lives. We want to know. His will, though, is that we obey his word. Do you follow me here, church? We need to understand his word. John chapter 1 in the Gospels, the Gospel of John teaches us in, in chapter 1 that the word of God is Jesus. So if we're not following Jesus, that by effect means we're not following God. The will of God, church, is that we're following the word of God. So Deborah, Deborah knows what the word of God says. So she calls Barak over and she says, the word of God is clear. Your obedience is what we're waiting for. How good to have a friend like Deborah in our lives, isn't it? She not only knows the word of God, but she has the boldness and the courage to tell us the truth when we hesitate. Wow. Let's look at Barak's response to this. Verse 8. Barak says to her, Well, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't. It's kind of funny, but the word of God is clear. The problem now is Barak's lacking courage. Obviously, Deborah doesn't lack courage. You're already leading the people, so I won't go unless you come with me. The amazing thing is Deborah is happy to communicate the word of God, but she's also willing to walk with her friends to see victory through. Deborah doesn't sit back and say, oh, do this and do, don't do that. Figure it out for yourself now. She has the willingness, the receptivity to walk with her friends to the end. Wow, I hope to, I hope to find a friend like that. Don't you? We might come, what might come up in your Bible study? And this is kind of funny. What might come up in your Bible study is you might start to realize that this is a highly patriarchal society that we're talking about here. And you might question, why doesn't Barak look at Deborah and say, well, I'm not listening to you because you're a woman. And some of you might even think, wow, hold on a second. Didn't it just say Deborah was leading Israel? So, okay, I can imagine some of you are flipping over to your New Testament and you're pulling out the, the, the epistles of Paul and you say, hold on, look a sec. De Paul is saying here, Deborah is breaking the commands of God. We take passages out of the Bible sometimes and we, we do what's called biblical origami. We fold that passage just so the right way so it fits into what I'm living. Many of us men... And I'm talking to the men here. We don't listen to women because we have this verse in the New Testament. We hold up as our banner and we, we believe that we're living it out right in our lives. That God says, I'm the leader of my household. God says, I am the leader of my household. Therefore, you need to listen to me. God put me in charge. You listen to me. Dare I say, perhaps God did put you as the leader of your household. He put you in charge. But the Bible teaches that the best way to lead is to listen. James chapter 1. Follow me. James 1 verse 19. It reads, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, emphasis, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Do you hear that, church? The best way to lead is to listen to your wife. 
The best way to lead is to listen to your mother. The best way to lead is to listen to your sisters in Christ. I have the incredible privilege to see all three of my children faithful in the Lord today. Do you think I did that on my own? Not a chance. I am so proud to say that when my wife gave me advice on how to lead family devotionals, I listened to her. My wife is the other side of the A-frame. Without her in my house, everything would call, fall crashing down. Barak knew it. He knew this concept. And he wasn't even afraid to ask for help. He says, I won't go unless you go with me. How are you doing today, guys? Some of you have yet to grow up to be men because you don't listen to godly women in your lives. This does not mean you wait till you're, you have a wife to listen. Good leadership starts today. And we, as a church, we need to treat our sisters with the dignity that they deserve. Remember what said, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Wow, do you hear those words? Both male and female, God created us in the image of himself. On this International Women's Day, let us give our sisters respect and the dignity they deserve. Barak doesn't hesitate. He knows this is a woman of God speaking the word of God. There's no hesitation for him. He says, I won't go unless you come with me. Please, please, Deborah, come with me. So Deborah steps up and steps into the gap. Where Barak lacks courage, Deborah speaks the truth. When he continues to lack courage, she agrees to go with him. So guess what? They go into battle together. So let's finish up the story here in verse 12 to 17. I don't think I'm quite finished, but follow along with me. Chapter 12. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Herosheth Hagovim, to the Kishon River, all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go! This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and he fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Herosheth, Hegoim, and all of Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Because there was alliance, there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael, verse 18, went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent. She covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you if anyone is there, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, she picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep. Exhausted, she drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. No kidding, he died. What do I do with this story? Okay, what an ugly story. She drove a tent peg into his head. God is trying to show his grace through this story. Remember the dirtiness of your story? God here is willing to fight an epic battle to set his people free when he hears their cry. He does the same thing for us today, not with one stake, but with two stakes, one in each hand of Jesus our Lord. And today as we celebrate Women's Day, the International Women's Day, it's God's glory. Deborah and Barak fought together the good fight. Us as brothers and sisters in the Lord 
Today, 2021, we fight the good fight together. Let's lift each other up. Let's carry each other through the, the finish lines together as Deborah walked with Barak. Let us fight the good fight together because God is awesome and he hears our cry. Let's take a moment to pray right now and remember the stakes that were driven through the hands of Jesus Christ and the blood that was spilt for us to wash us clean and give us a new hope. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for uh, your grace. Thank you so much that you do hear our cry, that you fight the ugly battles to lift us out of our dirtiness of our lives, the sin that we're entangled in. You give us a new family, a new hope, and a new dream. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, the incredible sacrifice. The price that you were willing to pay is more than we can imagine. Thank you so much for that, and we thank you for our salvation. In his name, amen.